Hi, I'm Stephanie Nina Pizzarillos, co-creator of DR163, creator of Zine 100, and you're listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented creator. She is not only a prose writer, she is also a comic creator, a zine creator, a, a variety of other amazing things <laughs> that she has done that I will let her describe because I don't know everything about her career, and that's why she's on the show. <laughs> and because I'm a horrible at names, I'm going to let her actually introduce herself. We are joined today by the ever talented Stephanie Nina Pizzarillos. <laughs> Hi, Kurt. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me on. You know, I love having new creators on the show that I have never interacted with because it, it lets me see what they're doing in whatever mediums they're working on. It's because that's that's what I love, whether it's experimental, whether it's zines, whether it's comic creation, prose, authors, whatever it is. You know, I love interacting with new people because it's something that I like about this show is, is flexibility, being able to talk with whoever comes on. And, and it's great to have you on the show. And you have such a, an amazing array of talents that I don't <laughs> even know where to start. Many to. hats, many hats. Yes, that's me. <laughs> so uh, for those that don't know anything about yourself, tell us who you are and, and what Sure, you sure. So here's, here's the short. Um, I always like to start out. I'm a proud mom of three daughters. It's an important role in my life. Um, I'm also a writer. I write in both prose, comics. I'm a zinester. I zine. I create those fun little booklets called uh, zines. Do a lot of volunteer work. So I serve as the not librarian, as I like to call it, because I'm not a real actual librarian. But if you ask the kids in the elementary school where I volunteer at, I am a elementary school not librarian, which is a lot of fun. I get a lot of insight in a uh, kid in middle grade uh, publishing, and I get to spend other people's money and buy books, which is oh so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and go to comic cons and buy comics and, and put out those kinds, kinds of things in the library. Totally forgot about my public uh, health uh, hat. My profession, my professional background for over 15 years uh, has been a public health uh, professional. I say advocate at this point in my life, really pushing for health issues of, 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 of an assortment. And we, and we can get into that. And I'm really, really excited and proud of my new roles in publishing, where I serve as a board member uh, for Graphic Mundi, uh, a publishing imprint of Penn State University that um, started last year with really some great books that have just been put on so many best of lists. So I'm really proud of that. And I serve as a volunteer submission panelist for um, Comics Experience, um, CEX Publishing. So a lot of hats, a lot of roles, um, and I love each one of them. We can go into so many different avenues here. Uh, let's let's dive into the comic side of things first, and specifically, actually, let's go into the Dear One Hundred and Sixty Three comic specifically. You've done a, a variety of things, but let's focus on that. Uh, for those that for those that don't know anything about Dear One Hundred and Sixty Three, well, what is that all about? So, Dear One Hundred and Sixty Three, um, it's currently a comic on Webtoon. Um, but you can actually also find it on our website via the ninagalaxy.com. But it is a co-creation with uh, illustrator Aaron Guzman, who is also my cousin, my partner in crime and how I got into comics uh, in, the, in the first place. But it's a really cool uh, story that follows a doctor in need of healing and the graffiti artist that has the medicine. If you really, if you like style writing, graffiti, that's Aaron's background. That's his style. If you want like a really mind-bending scroll down that world where we have a doctor, Dr. Cave, who's a, a doctor, very much traumatized military veteran, seen a lot and struggling through some of the things that he's seen and trying to get back to practicing surgery. And this graffiti legend that everyone swore was dead, who he meets suddenly as a patient. The story is very much layered either. It's really cool, sort of out of this world, I would guess you would say horror, sci-fi elements to it. You know, you can enjoy the story in that format where you can also enjoy the, for the story as uh, a critique in price gouging in the pharmaceutical industry. Everything's going to have a sort of public health hat in what I do too, and a criticism of how uh, money plays into some of the wars um, that humans like to wage. So a really fun webtoon comic um, that Aaron and I are looking to uh, expand to a season two, probably in print format. Um, it's really cool, I think. You touched on a couple of things there, and, and obviously some of the themes are, are pretty relevant, but 
What theme spoke to you as you were creating this comic? I really am struck by we walk with wounds, right? And those wounds might be very different depending on the paths we've been dealt in life. And sometimes the most unexpected characters or people you meet can help you with those wounds and healing and, and invite you to areas that you never thought possible or that you'd ever walk. Um, you know, what does a graffiti artist, you know, have in common with a doctor? Now, there's some cases where you have style writers that did become uh, physicians and you can say it intersected there. But I was very much intrigued by this idea of friendship of unlikely characters and how two very different people can offer help and healing uh, with some big life issues. I would say that struck me the most. And Aaron's very cool art, <laughs> very unique. You have so many hats in, in your life so far, and I'm sure you're going to have more hats in the future here. <laughs> How has your role in not only public health as a public health advocate affected your creativity as a writer? Well, it definitely informs the underlayer of the layers, I should say, for my work. Um, I think if anyone that reads my work, it's not just what you see on the surface. There are always so, so, so many layers to it. And, you know, DR163 is just one example of where you can either enjoy a cool sort of sci-fi, horror-ish, literary graffiti story, or you could see a total critique of the pharmaceutical industry and the, uh, the war Um corporation complex. So it definitely informs all um, of those layers. I mean, even in my prose story, for example, Gene, which is in the anthology um, Speculative Fiction for Dreamers. Yeah, it's a story about a girl who uses uh, Marvel comics as her star map uh, to navigate through life and wormholes. There's also scenes where she'll explain sometimes being an incredible Hulk, right? Having this like split personality of a Bruce Banner and, and, you know, the incredible Hulk is due to underlying, you know, microaggressions of racism in society and how that's a public health issue and how having nutritionists and, um, you know, this kind of spills into my Z100, but that have no knowledge of your culture telling you what you should eat and what's healthy and not can contribute to you becoming an incredible Hulk. <laughs> so you'll always see these little pathways of where, you know, you might be reading this, but I'm actually schooling you on some public health layers. It's always in there. I bake it in there. Lots of layers. <laughs> it makes a good lasagna and it makes, you know, good comics as there well you go. Too, or in, in any type of uh, entertainment that we consume on a mass scale these days as well. Speaking of Zine 100, since you brought it up, because this is a great segue, you're, you're doing wonderful. I don't even have to talk and crop. This is beautiful. I love it. Uh, Zine 100 is your current Kickstarter campaign, um, because we we have to mention that, because that's why you're also on the show here. Yes, well. it wasn't an innocent slip, Kurt. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're guiding the interviewer. I love that. That's great. Uh, and I don't mind. So Zine 100 is your Kickstarter campaign currently. It's an interesting concept that is... A story that I've not seen being told recently, uh, in the sense that you're you're shedding again your your entire aspect of your style is education of some way, shape, or form, which I love, and that that's more needed. That's needed more in comics than ever. Personally, tell us what Zine One Hundred is all about, and why is it important to you? Uh, so Zine One Hundred is um, a zine that I currently have on Kickstarter. Why it has that one hundred is that I took up Kickstarter's nudge, um, you know, a blanket uh, email. Of Make 100, start out small. And I do have some bigger Kickstarter projects down the road. And I said, this would be a great way to start. Um, so there's the 100 on there. And it's a, a zine. It's called um, How Not to Be Colonized by Outreach Programs, a how-to zine on working with people who offer you stuff. And its angle is very much public health, hence the outreach. But it's basically a zine, aka little booklet, that really walks you through some crucial questions you should ask a funder that is giving you money or programming. If not questions, these are little things that you should be adding to that program to help shape it so that not just the program funder gets something out of it, but you get something out of it too. 
because in my years of working in public health, which has done some tremendously wonderful things, I also saw the harm. And in medicine, first, do no harm. That harm can come from not being culturally aware or caring about the target community, which might be very different than your background, coming in with messaging that makes people feel bad about their identity, whether it's their native diets, whether it's their behaviors, whether it's not investing in local economies to support the so-called behavior change or whatever it is. So the Z100 is like this pocket-sized public health consult or just a consult for me in a really affordable form where even if it's just a quick read, because it's a very simple zine, if it just sparks some things in your mind to think about before you take that money from the big soda company or you take a programming in your school that's doing outreach because, oh, poor kids or poor, you know, whatever health issue or whatever, oh, marginalization, we're going to do this. You can also shape these programs. Do not just be grateful and say, thank you, thank you, thank you for saving us. And that's just it in the gist. You know, if you look at the reward tiers, it's not just a zine. Um, There's one that actually comes with a webinar where, again, really cheap public health consult for me. I actually walk you through this with real life examples. Mm -hmm. I wanted to offer something back to community, to those that, whether it be leaders, whether it be, you know, school officials, community groups, that the bigger corporations and universities and hospitals already have. They know the best practices, but I want them to get that messages on what they should be expecting back. So that's what Z100 is in a long uh, nutshell. (laughs) And I think we're seeing this a lot more frequently with a pandemic currently. We're we're seeing because of the pandemic help this group or this group or this group. And and realistically, we we're not aware or what's the, what's the phrase? Um, The you're you're not just paved with good intentions. Yes, exactly. That's exactly it. (laughs) So these are very, and you know, in a, an interview I did, which is probably the most, I, can't, I, I survived it. It was a lawyer, live radio program, and a lawyer cross-examined me <laughs> at C100. Um, <laughs> I had to reiterate that, yes, in a lot of these instances, nobody's painting the bad old villain, although you can get the bad old villain, right, sitting on, on a sack of gold. But for the most part, um, and certainly in my life experiences, these are good intended people. These are folks that you know, want to improve folks, people's lives, but are not doing enough of the work to make sure that their goals of improving lives as they see fit is not also harming other aspects of of life, you know? And I use the example of a kid in an elementary school, and it was an outreach program I was running in an elementary school. I had no control over the content of what the nutritionists were putting out in this. We tried, right? We explained why these healthy snack options that you're putting were not going to jive, were not available in the neighborhood, and had nothing to do with the culture uh, of the community. They were sent home anyway. You know, a mom went up to us after, you know, said, my kids stop eating the lunches I send. What's going on? What are you doing? That my-? And, you know, when we talked to the child um, with the parent, the kid's like, my mom cooks bad food. We're, we're not, we're, that's bad. We're not supposed to be eating that. We're supposed to be eating Triscuits and blueberries. And it was, that was awful. And the mom's cooking, in that case, traditional Dominican food. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but when you get a flyer home that says this, 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 and has nothing to do, it's not mangoes, it's not papaya, it's not, you know, anything... Kids, you know, particularly for kids, if you're doing outreach, you're going to send home some harmful and self-hating messages. You know, you might have good intentions, but I don't want those intentions if you're going to get a kid coming up to me and and a mom saying that. Sorry, that was deep. (laughs) No, no, no. I mean, I was like... (laughs) I grew up in the the 80s and 90s, you know. I I grew up in, in decades where the food pyramid was basically bread and everything else. Yes. So it, it's exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> there, there was no real uh, nutritional guide that it was a one size fits all that never really fit everyone. For me, lifestyle choices were, were difficult because I learned both, you know, the good side of fast food and or the bad side of fast food and the good side of cooking. So, you know, I'm, right. And look, it's always a challenge when you're doing this type of um, outreach, like, If you're going to say, for example, like, oh, fast food, you know, not healthy, 
But you're not acknowledging that for some parents, that's either their only option because of that's what's there or time or money, even though we can break down and how the long run may be, you know, cooking your own can lead to um, lower, you know, costs. We can have a whole discussion of that. And then you get into the time thing. Unless we also include a discussion around that, we don't like demonize things. You're not going to really go anywhere with these programs. Your programs are not going to be effective and people aren't going to be feeling good about themselves. So, you know, it's a tricky balance. That's where it's like harm reduction, right? And the public health model is, you know, okay, we know you're going to do this, but here's a healthier way to do it. Um, And certainly when I worked with restaurants, one thing we did was, no, you don't change your rice and beans, right? In, In the chicken. No, but maybe you can have an option that has smaller portion sizes, right? So it's not like a mountain of rice, has more green. And we called that dish, add some green to la bandera. La bandera meaning flag, but also a play on the national national sort of uh, home comfort food of rice, beans, and meat. That can sell. That shows your respect, tradition, what's good. That's going to be better than eating a bowl of Triscuits, <laughs> right? Like home cooked yeah. yummy food. So it's it's little things, it's little things like that. What are some of the most important lessons that you've learned as both an educator and as a creator trying to get your message across? Hmm, that's a good one. Well, the obvious of, of what I've been stressing is make sure you know your audience, who are you speaking to, and craft your messaging to that audience. It goes nowhere if you say, eat Martian blueberries and you live on Earth, because I can't find any Martian blueberries here. So definitely craft your messaging and know your audience know your audience. I would say, you know, think out of the box. Most of my public health career was breaking the rules because um, universities, corporations, um, uh, bureaucracies just are not maybe as hip as the private industry sometimes, or they're just, there's just so much red tape. So think about different partners you can bring in um, to your programming that can help you reach your goal. And for me in my work, it's always been artists. You know, when we had our first uh, community meeting, and I'm kind of steering to the public health to help guide me back to the, mm-hmm. you know, comics and stuff if I'm too much on the public health side. But when we had our first community meeting, uh, when we were launching this uh, childhood obesity prevention and lifestyles program, I brought to the table like artists, like, you know, and I mean that in a loose, you know, loose sense, whether they would be painters. Uh, or uh, filmmakers, community, smaller community groups, not like the same old big ones that um, the hospital was always partnering with. And, you know, the physicians are like, what are you doing? Like, why are these people here? And I'm like, we're doing social marketing, right? I, <laughs> I don't want doctors doing social marketing. You need artists. I want community influencers. I hate using that word now. (laughs) Community leaders, people that have a pulse on community that can spread messages to the community. They're going to be more effective. And I want to really know what's going on. So definitely think out of the box. Don't be limited by what the people are the same old stuff over and over and artists, man, and pay them, Mm -hmm. pay them. Do not particular. I I love when universities say we don't have money for that. Oh yeah, you do. (laughs) You do have money for that. You're just choosing not to invest it in this way because you're used to the same old things and you're used to the same old, you know, I'm going to fund this and you box yourself with, well, they're not a vendor. Well, it's really impossible to become a vendor (laughs) for you, big corporation, big hospital. If you're able to push, push, if you have that influence and if you're on the community side, make noise. You know, a lot of change is done because you are making noise. Exposure doesn't pay bills, plain and simple. You have yes. to pay your creative talent, no matter who it is and, and what genre they're, they're working in film, comics, etc. Being sincere in what you're doing goes a long way. You shouldn't necessarily have an expectation that something will come out of it, but I'm going to just say that 85% of things that I've gone somewhere is because I was noticed, because I was being sincere, not that I was seeking it. And that doesn't mean you hide and it doesn't mean you don't self-promote. You know, it was Michelle Obama, First Lady Michelle Obama's team that reached out to me and said, I've been watching you for the past year and what you're doing with this program. And I want you to come with these 11 other groups and help me shape my program. It wasn't because I was like, look at me, look what I'm doing. 
I was just sincere in how I was investing in the community that I was serving. The well, same thing with TED Med, you know, and TED Med is the medical equivalent of TED Talks. They're like, we like what you're doing. We've been watching you. We want you to serve with us as being ambassador for X, Y, Z, this, that, and the other. You know, I've had the fortune with my writing as well. And But you gave me permission to do this, Kurt, so I'm going to. I did. And, uh, <laughs> I've, I've, had, I've never shot myself in the foot when it comes to these types of interviews, so it works out. But I do know in the past, you know, you, you, one of your questions are mentorships, right? And this is all connected. You know, there's a season for everything in my life. I feel people, there are seasons um, for people that enter your life, you know, simply showing up, showing up, guys. That's like half of everything showing up and just being you. You know, I've gotten uh, a lot of guidance. You would call them mentorships in my writing um, because I challenged myself to take a writing course. And that right, that professor saw what I was doing and said, I love this so much. I want to mentor you for a year off grid, not part of the university. Um, and, you know, I've been fortunate with that, or I saw how much, you know, you know, my work with Shelly Bond, for example, on insider art, um, a, she loved my story and I love you back, Shelly. I also showed up, right? I was present. I promoted it on Kickstarter and I'm just repeating stuff. She said in interviews led to a lovely friendship. And yes, you know, in, in a lot of ways, me giving her some, you know, insight on things and her mentoring me with her years of wisdom in the comics industry. So yes, yeah, sincerity goes a long way. And that's why I kind of snuck in that question, but it was so related to, you know, lessons learned, be sincere. Then obviously you've done many things in, in your lifetime here, but what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh my goodness. You got me on that one. That one I was not prepared uh, for. I will say that I'm not using the word pivot because that's also a word I'm getting annoyed at hearing. <laughs> but a turning point for me in the power of language was reading Love in the Time of Cholera. Besides it making me realize why my SAT scores were as low as they were <laughs> for English, which is a whole discussion on how part of that is why I didn't write till later in life, because I thought SAT scores meant, oh, well, if you got that low, you can't write. Um, but putting that aside as a New York City public school uh, child, that was the first book that really, really, really moved me. And I was a reader. I was always a reader, you know, as a kid, but I could not shake. I, I think that was the first book where that story stayed. Yes, partial to love story narratives. You know, I mean, my X-Men thing was always looking for the Gene Cyclops uh, story. And it's part of why I stopped reading that when Cyclops decided to do what he did. Um, <laughs> that was my end point of really the last time I, I mean, I do read comics now, but it took like a 20 year break or something. Or 15, but whatever. I don't, I don't think you missed anything. <laughs> okay. That's what I hear. <laughs> With all respect. Yeah. Reading that story and seeing just the beauty of words and language and just historical detail in culture, how that book made me just have a love of coffee. Like I'm very influenced by what I'm reading and, and how it affects what I eat. It's very true. You know, the Mambo King's sing songs of love. I love steak and beer now. I mean, that, that, that meal was repeated throughout the, the book. Anzaruti's mystery novels that take play, place on the Greek islands or without throughout Greece. It's just if you love food and you love Greek food, man, you'll be, you'll be hungry. Yeah, I would say that reading that first book, ultimately for me, yeah, reading Lawrence Durrell too, the Alexandria Quartet. You didn't ask me for books, but these were important uh, moments for me of how I could be utterly transported in a place where I make the own, my own pictures based on the writer's words. Yeah, I've read books before, but there was something about these works that totally transported me. We could be reading the same words, but have a very different experience as an audience because we make these pictures in our mind. And I, I find that so fascinating, so lovely. So what was the first book that made you cry? Oh, Lord. Lord. Oh, I know that. I actually do know that. Yeah. Charlotte's Web. That traumatized me. Yeah. <laughs> it was horrible. I mean, it was a great book. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. like my, my daughter, my second grader, I think she read it this year. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> she was like, she's the same reaction as me. So Charlotte's Web, dude, that's, that's some sad stuff. I mean, that's, that's the, the power of writing right there. True. Yeah. 
that in 1984 was pretty. Uh, yeah. I mean, and I did go through my George uh, Orwell. Um, so, yeah. I mean, we all do. I think we're forced to, in, in <laughs> yeah, school, to be right? perfectly honest. It's not a choice. <laughs> If it's not George Orwell, it's Shakespeare. If it's not yeah, you Shakespeare, know, man, I don't know what they taught me in school. I, I didn't learn any any of the classics. Were not we were not given. What's your most recent literary pilgrimage that you've gone on? Literary pilgrimage. Wow. <laughs> I have to give that some thought. I mean, this wasn't my recent. So let's see if I can remember my most recent after I, as I tell you this. I did take a trip to Greece. It was a oh. while ago. My my husband um, really, and he's so much a supporter of my writing. I call him my domestic editor, and like the only editor you could get like really mad at because <laughs> it's your husband. Like, <laughs> like, what do you know? But he's usually right in the end and I change it. It was actually my first, my first novel that I, that I wrote a uh, historical fiction that takes place in 1940. It goes from 19... 19- 13-ish uh, to 1944, uh, Anatolia and Greece. I was trying to write the ending and I needed this like epic, some sort of epic scene of that had to do with the sky, right? The stars, you know, this is pre-kids. It's like, well, we need to go back to Greece and we were due for a vacation. We were both working and had that extra money to do these things. Taking a car and driving through the places where my character walked by foot as a refugee being in the mountains of Mount Tagitos, where my character would figure out where he was by counting the stars of Orion's belt, being in the olive groves where he would be hiding from uh, German soldiers, driving up to the northern Ipiros mountains, still not having my ending, my thing. It was evening and we were eating dinner and we were in the mountains and I saw this red globe in the sky. And I was just like, what is that? It is not the sun. <laughs> the moon is not red. What is that? And the waiter who lives there and sees these things all the time, he said, it's a lunar dawn. It was like almost a religious moment. I have never seen anything like that. I have not experienced. I'm a New York City girl. You don't really see stars. But it was the scene, the place where the book ends. And it was the celestial moment that I was looking for. That was my most epic, you know, literary pilgrimage. I will also pay some ode and some roots to, you know, where my writing is now. You know, anytime I'm in, in El Barrio, in New York City, um, in Manhattan, which has a very strong New York and Puerto Rican um, uh, background and life right now, a lot of my writing now is about New Rico with New Rican characters. So anytime I'm walking those streets and I'm there at least twice a week, that's a literary pilgrimage because I'm getting to know my characters better. I'm being present in their worlds, which intersect with my own. I consider that a literary pilgrimage. Do you believe someone could be a writer if they don't feel emotion? Oh, well, I don't know a Spock, right? I don't know if, if pretty sure we all can experience some capacity unless I'm missing something and somebody can inform me. And that there are, there's some capacity of human emotion involved in all of our experiences. You know, what is a book? I mean, am I going to judge a book by something that can only evoke emotional character? I mean, I think you can have books that, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm now going to backtrack. I mean, yeah, you can write a book without emotions. Whether that book then connects to people, whether it becomes effective storytelling is another, is another story altogether. Um, I think there's something to be said by being able to connect emotionally. But hey, I don't know, maybe, maybe someone can. You know, is there someone out there that doesn't experience any type of human emotion and you want to show me their book, you know, let me know. So then what is your creative writing kryptonite? My kryptonite is that I don't have enough time. Mm. I don't knock on wood expe uh, experience writer's block, right? That does not mean to say I don't get scared if someone comes at me with, can you write this? Because I go through every, no matter what, how did I, how do I write? How do I do this? How did I start, right? It's always the hardest is, start, is, is starting something new. But my kryptonite is that I have so many stories that I want to do, you know, limited by the amount of time that I have to do them. And I'm not someone that I'm someone that can really focus 
one thing that I've learned with comics in particular, and as you start start getting into actually the publishing aspect of writing, and it's not just you doing it for you, is that you're going to be required to do more than one project at the same time. And my mind really likes to invest 150% into one project. My kryptonite in all this is that I just get sucked into those worlds and get really annoyed if I don't have the time to actually complete them and then having to switch hats and do something else. I would say that's my kryptonite. Time sucks. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe we'll figure that out too. You know, all these things in quantum physics and all that. (laughs) Maybe. We'll see. Before I do that, though, is there anything that I haven't touched upon? And we'll get to the social media and where we can find the Kickstarter campaign towards the end of the interview. But is there anything I haven't touched upon that you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview? You take your pick. If if comics uh, are your thing, then you could definitely find me on uh, Webtoons. I would say hop to my website. You know, there's some free comics on there, whether it be from Mermaids Monthly, my work with uh, Seth Martell and Andromeda, whether it be um, DR163, which is um, a Webtoon comic with uh, illustrator Aaron Guzman. Um, or Women in Comics. Um, you could find me in their summer debut uh, issue uh, with illustrator Rafael Romeo Magat. There's a lot to be found there. Or maybe you like prose. We've gotten a lot of great reviews for Speculative Fiction for Dreamers. My story in that is Jean, COVID Chronicles. I have also, it's actually a comic anthology by Graphic Mundi. Just hop to my website. There's a lot to choose from. Definitely folks should look out for me for future projects later down the road. What in life is beautiful to you? What is life? Love and kindness. I would say those are being kind. And I I consider that an aspect of love and being nice to one another is something that is beautiful. And sometimes you find abundance of it in life, but sometimes it can be rare. So kindness and love, I would say, were the two things. What is one mistake you will never, ever do again? Hmm. Mistakes and regrets. Don't got regrets. You know, I would be, does not mean I have not made mistakes, Um, but I would be a different person if I had regrets, right? I've learned. I would say, and this is pretty general, but you can apply it to a lot of situations, not knowing when I should have walked away from something sooner. And what do I mean by that? That can play out You know, it's also a a good character trait because I invest, I invest, I, you know, have faith in people. I try to make things work, but whether it be a job, you know, having had a job where it was a very toxic work environment and nothing was going to change, whether it was the human relations between people, just incompetency, but kind of being a good girl and listening, oh, your first job, you should, out of college, you should stay there for two years, no matter what. Nah, there are some situations where you should leave a job. (laughs) even if it's been less than two years, you can apply that to relationships, whether it's romantic, whether it's familial, you know, on what's healthy and what isn't. And here's the big thing, publishing. You know, I spent a lot of time waiting. I spent a lot of time playing the traditional publishing game of, you know, when people asked, well, is anything of yours published? And I'm like, no, because I spent the past 10 years getting an agent, trying to get an agent. And you can look at that a lot of ways, right? You can make a decision and say, I only want traditional publishing. And that'll depend on, well, are you writing literary fiction? Are you writing romance? You know, what, you know, some things don't require gatekeepers. But making sure that you're not playing by the rules too much, because maybe those rules are meant to keep you out, I think would have saved me a lot of time in in exploring different avenues um, where I find myself, you know, blessed now. It can apply still in publishing and knowing when to walk. You know, I had to walk away from a very high profile agent. It wasn't, it wasn't healthy. It wasn't good. It wasn't something that was adding to my work. You know, make sure your, your editors, you're, you're in sync with them. Make sure that, you know, that whatever compromises that you understand and this resonates with you, that your book's not being whitewashed, um, if that applies. It might be scary to walk, but it might be healthier to walk. I think that's the biggest thing that um, I've certainly learned from. What is the second wisest thing someone's ever said to you that has stuck with you in your varying career? So I'm glad I didn't put this in earlier, <laughs> but this is what comes out. Uh, this is what comes to mind first. My One of my first writing teachers, um, 
Alyssa Albert, she was rephrasing uh, a very common advice that we you give young writers. It's probably been changed, or maybe this is the original. She didn't start it, but this is what was told to me. <laughs> Take what you know and write about what you love. And as soon as I she said that, I, I, this was my first writing class I was taking at Columbia University. I was in an, as an employee, you get to take free writing. You could take free like graduate classes at the time. I don't know if they have that now, but I was stuck. I was trying to write. Nothing came out, but like maybe bad poetry. I wanted to be the sci-fi writer. It just nothing worked. It just, I couldn't. Probably the only time in my life where I could say, oh, I couldn't write. Once she said that, I said, wait a minute, I have all this historical knowledge of, you know, World War II Greece, my life living, growing up, you know, in New Rico. Once I was able to understand that, and then what do I love? I love comics. I love sci-fi things. Using the foundation of all the historical knowledge and cultural knowledge that I knew, I was actually then, it just poured out. A novel literally poured out from me. It was the best writing advice I ever got. It opened up a dam because I was allowed to write about what I loved, but use what I know. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't expand your knowledge. You shouldn't challenge yourself, but it was able for me to get a, a big start. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Mm. So I'm going to... I'm going to backtrack to what I, I said. I kind of sound like Patrick in his interview in that, you know, there was not one person, right? There was never just one person, but a person of, for the season of my life. Certainly, I will say that having one of my, it was my second writing teacher at Columbia, Susan Thames, saw my writing and took the next year and just mentoring my, my one of my first works um, and giving me insight because she just so believed in me. Um, that certainly served as a, a writing mentor uh, for a year. Uh, Laura Pegram from Quayley, um, an online journal for writers of color. Same situation. Laura loved my work and has been an off, uh, you know, to the side advocate and mentor for my writing, particularly and in, in all my short story, I, I would say wizardry came from that one class uh, with Laura. It's Shelley Bond. It was great meeting her uh, when I first started out with comics and enjoying a friendship that was also infused with wisdom of her years. So you didn't get one, <laughs> but you got a few because that's just how my life has played out with walking with the seasons and the characters that, that walk into your life. From a professional perspective, you have created multiple comics. You have a Kickstarter coming up. You have been educating various organizations and people throughout your lifetime. And you have done many great things in your career. So professionally, you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Okay, yes, I do. And I'm going to define and say success. success is also shared as a blessing. And what do I mean by that? So for me, my most important, how I feel successful is my family. It's something I worked hard for. It's something I've always wanted in my life. So I'm always going to put them first and having children. And I, and I see that as that's also a blessing. And it's really a blessing because it's not a choice for a lot of people. I'm always going to put them number one. Basic human right. I have food and shelter. So I would say success. Yes. Blessing. Yes. Also human right that I think we should all have. But here, listen to me. I'm happy. You know, you're talking to me at a time where I'm happy with where I am. That doesn't mean stuff's not going on in life. We always have that. We're surfing a pandemic. But if I can answer you that I'm, I'm, am I happy? I think I've, I've reached some success. You want to push me on the publishing realm, Kurt? You know, yeah, look, my stories are being shared. If you asked me 10 years ago, I didn't care about that. I was just writing stories and I was squirreling them away and that was fine. But I did make the decision to cross over to actually sharing them and them not sitting just in my hard drive or in me just enjoying them. And the fact that I'm sharing them is a wonderful thing. Do I have goals? I certainly do. We could take this further. But yes, I definitely feel successful. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Humor. Come on. We got to laugh. 
from, you know, look at all of our comedians and a lot of the stuff that, that they came from. And then they, they become great comedians. So I definitely try to make humor uh, or have humor about things. I put things in perspective in the grand scheme, you know, do I have my home, my family, you know, depends on the type of failures we're talking about. But here's something that really helped me. I'm a salsa dancer and I started salsa dancing by knowing zero. And I started a time when I was beginning to start pitching myself to like to, to join the market in publishing. And the one thing with salsa dancing, you know, you walk into the, the social, right? <laughs> you see all these fabulous dancers. You see these spins. You see these shines. I mean, and you're like, I am still counting in my head. But you know that with practice, you're going to get there. But to get there, you got to laugh at the fool you're going to be in the process. So, and you're going to also have to pitch yourself. You're going to have to, you know, be shameless and ask, will you dance for me? I've dealt with failure in the same way that I've made a fool of myself on the dance floor. You just laugh. It's part of the journey. There'll be other opportunities for you to get better and, you know, be a better version of yourself. The young generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And in your case, you have the young generation with you and whether or not they want to become a, a writer or a comic creator or whatever they would like to do creatively, I'm sure they'll be more than accomplished in, in doing that, especially with your guidance. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Well, the most easiest is open some doors for them. Don't gatekeep. Invite the next generation in. Um, you know, don't have this Highlander mentality of there can be only one. Um, I think that's one of the easiest things that we can do and inspire. Um, and hand in hand with that is, you know, be nice and show love. There's such cruelty in the world. Um, you know, I, I kind of feel like, I don't know if any of you guys watch PBS, but at one point PBS had this little commercial where this light was then passed to the other person and that person smiled and that light and, you know, and it just becomes a domino effect of happiness. So definitely be kind. As a Gen Xer, I would say that we have a special role of those that grew up before a digital world, but then adjusted because we were still of that young age of to learn easy uh, that also inhabits now and have become savvy, savvy in a digital world show this next generation that there can be a balance with the digital life and the physical life. We are bombarded with apps and this and that. And now pandemic has made everything virtual. I think there's a lot to say in having a balance with that, that it might be harder for generations that never lived without it. It's a healthy thing. You know, the art of conversation and, and looking at people in the eye, again, pandemic, <laughs> you know, holding a paper book, the artistry of a book, not just the content, not just what you're reading, but then the craftsmanship. And that can apply not just for, for publishing, for a lot of things. You can counter it. I read an interesting article on the argument that virtual reality or living in a simula simulation that is no different. That is reality. Who's to say that's not reality and this is? Now, if you want to take a matrix perspective, you're still plugged in. There's a physical human body plugged in something that's allowing you to live somewhere else. And we still have to tend to this physical human body. Um, so if we can teach each other a balance of living in both worlds, I think it'll go a long way in a lot of human uh, relationships. 100% agree. That works out really well. And I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I, thank you so much, Stephanie, for coming on the show. Thank you, Kurt. Well, you survived, so that's a good thing. <laughs> I did. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you on social media? And of course, where can we find the Kickstarter? Sure. So for Kickstarter, uh, Z100 ends February 17th. So definitely jump in. We're almost there. Maybe by the time you see this, we'll be there and trying to get our stretch goals. You can find us, just look up Zine 100, Z-I-N-E 100. It'll pull it right up for you. I am Zoe Health on Twitter. I am The Nina Galaxy on Instagram. If you want to keep remembering the Nina Galaxy, my link tree is the Nina Galaxy. It'll give you a link to absolutely everything. Um, and then my website, which is my very long name, Stephanie Nina Pizzarillos. 
Well, again, thank you for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it, Stephanie. And of course, you can find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, twogeekstalking.com or tgtmedia.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.